Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome again to uh, Destination Newry and uh, to our look at times past in the Newry area. And this week I'm joined by a very special guest, uh, Mickey Mullen, who is uh, a, a blacksmith by profession. And Mickey, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Jim. Now, Mickey, um, you're a resident, a long-term resident of Garve McLoon, but you actually started life in Liverpool. Well, yes, I was born in Liverpool in 1940, and uh, the parents and myself were blitzed out of it, so to speak. So they came back to Kilevi in 1941. Mm -hmm. uh, we arrived at Carrot McClone number four, Carrot McClone. And this is, this is the, the house? Of the house, yes. That was 1954. Mm -hmm. And on my way to school, the local school, South School, uh, I became interested in the blacksmith shop belonging to uh, Patrick Connolly. There was two blacksmith shops at Cloughbridge at the time, Connolly's and uh, uh, McGill. Uh, Joe McGill. Uh, over the next number of years I became very interested in, in blacksmithing work and I had a sort of a penchant to, to go at that, you know. Now, if we can just take a look, Mickey, at this image here. Yes. Um, I notice there's a lot of implements outside and I presume that they would have been made in the fire. They would have been forged. Oh, to be all hand forged. There was no hydraulic machinery in them days. They all forged on the anvil and fire, and uh, he shod all the horses, that is to say, putting new steel shoes on the horses. So I suppose, Mickey, in a way, we could nearly liken uh, Clog Bridge at the time to the modern-day motorway service. Well, you <laughs> yeah. could do that, yes. Uh, uh, I, re I remember six or eight horses waiting in queue to be, to be seen to, and... When, that, when he wasn't walking at horse, he'd be making ploughs and repairing yeah. ploughs. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of implements different. outside here. That's right. Yeah. And then of course we've got uh, what looks like the sleeve gullion, uh, the, the told, steam train that up behind. I'm told that's the sleeve gullion, and funny enough, she's still running. That's right. It's in yeah. the uh, the the railway preservation in uh, Whitehead. That there's picture the, will be taken, I suppose, around about forty three to forty five, forty eight. Right. That particular photograph. Uh huh. It's a very striking yeah. image, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, in fact, if we just yeah. take a wee look now, um, that's that's how it looks today that's in, right. with that's the right. lay-by. And then, of course, the other shot that we're going to see now uh, is where Joe McGill Correct. had his forge. Yes, just behind that wall that we're looking at there. So now. on each side of the road, yeah. we, we had a, a blacksmith mm. shop. Yeah. Joe McGill... Uh, by the way, he had a brother called Harry, uh -huh. and he could make a cart, wheels and all, finished, completed and painted, with a bag of tools, about six or eight bits of basic tools. Yeah, just basic tools. Basic tools, tools a few hatchets, a few hammers, a few spoke shaves, very little in the way of machinery. And that man could make a cart from the ground up, so to speak. And Mickey... Uh those skills wouldn't be wouldn't be available today, well, would they? Well, you would, you would travel up and down Ireland for maybe a week now to find one man that'd be capable of doing it. I remember, I remember some years ago. Um, no, I suppose it'd be twenty years. Uh, you'd be able to tell me. I remember the late Stephen Malone made a barrel gypsy caravan. That's correct. Me did. I made several of them, as a matter of fact, over the years. Yeah. But I remember the one you're talking about, all right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I think it was the Elmore family in Omeath. Don't know we would have walked that bought it. Because I w would go to Stephen yeah. in the evenings. Yeah. I walked there for three or four years. Uh, well, I, actually, I was making gits mostly. But yes, Stephen got into that and made coaches. And, and they actually. All sorts of ho horse drawn vehicles. Stephen's brother actually took over McGill's Forge, didn't he? Stephen's brother? No, Stephen left. Uh, he had a brother called Pat walked there, but then Pat went to Canada. Yeah. And, uh, no, Stephen... Pat actually operated uh, horse-drawn coaches in Central Park That's in New right. York. Uh, his son actually carries on, carries on that the, business today. That's correct, yes. But... Uh, uh, Hugh, wasn't Hugh Malone, he worked in the forge too, didn't he? He did for a while, but then he went to England. I think he went to Derby. 
yeah. to walk at the locomotive, says it's in the last picture there. Mm -hmm. He was a he was a master smith, forge walk. Very well and all that, yes. Right. Yes, yes. And I remember I remember Mickey, the late Stephen, telling me that when Pat went to New York, he got a job with the New York Police Department as a farrier. Quite possibly. Shoeing yes. shoeing the horses yes. for the yeah. for the police. Mm -hmm. And he, Pat told me himself that he had to actually undergo examinations. Oh, he would have, surely. You know, there, yeah. to, but yeah. it wasn't just a matter of mm -hmm. walking in and saying, I'm a blacksmith. No, no, no. You no, know? No. But to get back to Connolly's, uh, we have a fine image here of uh, of uh, what you tell me, uh, Paddy Connolly's father. Well, for the best of my knowledge, it was Paddy's father that made that maybe 10 years after Cloud Chapel was built. Now, this, this is at the grotto uh, that yeah. people would be familiar yes. with at Clog Chapel. That's right. And it was actually, I think, Father Devlin was responsible, Father, I think wasn't Father, he? Father Devlin put the, had that grotto put together and, as I said, uh, Tommy Connolly made that railing. Now, this is, a very, this is a very intricate-looking uh, uh, image of a cross. Yeah. What are we actually lo looking at there, Mickey? We're looking at a, a, a depiction of... A, I suppose you could call it a medieval Celtic cross. Do you see this, the half circles in it? Yes. That is the form of a Celtic cross. Some blacksmiths or some designers would have put a ring around that. Uh huh. But in that particular one, it's a very old image that there. Now, Mickey, uh, you said about um, you'd stop at the you'd stop at Clog Bridge with Paddy Connolly and. Uh, you 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 got a liking for I did what you saw and and uh, it it's a lovely image that you painted there of the the queue of horses yeah waiting mm -hmm. to be shod or mm -hmm. or whatever Paddy had to do mm -hmm. but um, that was on your way to and from Clog School that'd be yes for the ten years was at that school and of course that was across the road uh, from the, the the present day golf club. Uh, the school was there until That's right. they were That's relocated right. to Edward Street when the British Army sat yeah. at the watchtower there. Correct and right, yeah. So you left school at the age of 14? Uh, some months short of 14. And I believe it was back to <laughs> back to basics. Back to Liverpool. Back to Liverpool. <laughs> My father was going to, going to walk on a big pay track yes. up about uh, somewhere in Cheshire. And he asked me to go along with him with a view to getting a job there. Uh-huh. And... Being the way I am, I, w I couldn't say no. Right. So I went with him anyway, and uh, the first job I got was on the overhead railway in Liverpool. Yes. Guaranteed six pound a week and tips. That, sound, that sounds very, very, very lucrative, Mickey. It, it, it was very good at the time, <laughs> but it didn't work out. <laughs> 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 the school leaving age in England at the time was 15. Yes. As I said, I was three months or something like that, short of 14. Uh -huh. It was just the way I could leave school before the age of 14, the way the year fell. You know? Yes, yeah. I never fully understood it, but I <coughs> came to sign up to be started. A, I was showing the ropes, so to speak, how to carry the suitcases and how to be courteous and all that sort of thing. And then I came to sign up. That would have came to you naturally, Mickey. Well, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and... Uh, they discovered then that it was underage, so they wouldn't start me. Right. I didn't know enough to tell a wee, wee fib. You know, a wee white lay. A wee white lay. But uh, the next place I went to was over to my father's brother. He worked in the foundry in Camelard Shipyard. And they, they were massive. They were massive. Massive the shipbuilders yes, yes, yes. There'd be on, on, the the on the Mersey. They'd be on a par with uh, Harland Harland Wolves, yeah. And there again, not being a thinker. And afraid to tell a lie. Same thing happened there. I got a job as a tea boy. Yes. I often wondered where I would have went, or would I still be here at all <laughs> if I had it. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have been I still in Jamal Lurch. Well, definitely. That's for no, sure. That's for sure. It's gone. So the next job was I uh, went back to the aunt in Upper Parliament Street, and her on her infinite wisdom, she took me down to the labour exchange with a view to getting a job. Yes. But that didn't work either, either because when they discovered 
that I was underage. They insisted on you going to school? Me, yes. Deport me or forcibly put me to school. Deport? Deport, eh? Yes. Oh. But I, I kept ahead of them. I kept dodging back and forth over the Mersey on the ferry boat. Yes. I kept ahead of them. Yeah. But they finally caught me and actually <laughs> did escort me down to the boat. And you were deported? Al al along with my aunt, yeah. Anyway, that's all in the past. Uh, I got a job with Jack McCullough then to a, a neighbour of mine, actually a second cousin of mine. And funny enough, I hated it when I was at it a while. Because I couldn't get at it right. I couldn't get at the fire. Drilling holes and failing holes. You had to fail a hole or a, a round hole. You had to fail it out square to take the square bars, you see. And it was more than just work. I, I felt like crying many a morning going to work. But then I fell for it. And I got a wee bit more old-fashioned. I started cutting the, the square hole out, drill a pilot hole first, you see, and cut the square hole out with a, a crude oxyacetylene burner that we had at the time, and we touched the file. Mm. But I darn do this, you see, and let him know about it. Mm -hmm. Just the way they were funny like that. But, uh, yes, I grew to lo love the job, and I couldn't be beat home from it. And while I was there, we done all the railings on the three bridges across the canal. Hmm. Uh, from, actually, from, that, from that workshop. You actually told me, Mickey, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, did you tell me something one day about uh, you were working at the railings and the, the, the blood actually oh, and you get, ran you get, out of your hands? If, you're, use, if your you're, hands. you're using the file all day, every day for weeks, we're talking about two or three thousand holes to be squared out. And if you're pushing a fade, no matter what protection you had, you broke the skin eventually. You know, you could lap a bit of a cloth around it to soften it and that sort of thing. But it did, yeah, I went home any night and blood run to the heart of the hand. Well now, Mickey, um, when we look at this image of, um, of uh, the key today, that's the, the current location of, that's of right, yeah. uh, P and R. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and just tell us a wee bit, give us a flavour of the work that was done in McCullough's? Well, they had done the whole cross-section of what had to be done. They looked after the, the joiners and the carpenters in Uri. They uh, serviced the quarrymen. They done a bit for the railways, albeit not actual railway work, but making brackets for seats and all that type of thing. And uh, and of course they worked at the lighters as well, didn't they? They did, they did. Uh, well, that was way before my time now. Uh, they did, they serviced the lighters, maybe a patch to go on them or brackets to be made or some bit of straightening up to be done. And was there any and work? That was, that, was, that was in old James McCullough's mid-years. That was a constant job. Like mm. They had two smiths on that all the time. Done nothing, only that. They were going up and down to Porty Down, as you know. That's right, the yeah. yeah. Well, um, when you were there, Mickey, uh, many people were working in Jack's... Well, there was only out of three in my time. But there was a time there was actually seven fires going, as we talk about seven forges going. Yeah. There was two horseshoers. There was two wheelwrights. They'd be... For the carts. Shoe, ...shoeing wheels all day. And then there'd be two more doing all the furniture, as they called it, for the carts. You know, the, the, the hinges and the, all them brackets and mm. welding axles and making uh, bands for the nails for the, for the centre of the wheels. And uh, they'd done a lot of mill work. There was one story told about a big job that they'd gone with old James and uh, Mr Bailey of Bailey's Foundry. That was located out at Bessbrook. Correct. They walked through one another... Mm. They would, they would have, mm. Baileys would have made a lot of gas and for them, and they would have done a bit of forge work for Baileys, that's the way it was. But they'd have gone with this job, it was a, a three and a half inch shaft, what they call a lane shaft, it'd be running the full length of a mill, uh, a spinning mill, and uh, all the machinery would be driven off it. So when the shaft broke, the whole place closed down, maybe for six weeks, until they got a new shaft out of England. Right. You just couldn't go over the street and buy one of uh, these things like that. Yeah, over to Jerry but McParland. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 this thing, we had, we had the best part of two or three ton, a section of, it came in sections already. Yeah. But they took a 20 or 30 foot section of this shaft and anyway, and 
they decided they'd fire weld it and it took them four days and three nights to do it. A team of six men. Constantly it's, it's, working. It's hard, hard. Well, they spent a lot of time waiting on the fire. Yeah. You know, but uh, in order to weld the shaft like that, you have to do what is a uh, term now of setting it. If you have a three inch shaft, mm -hmm. you have to keep hammering it back into itself until it becomes a five inch shaft. And when you have the two ends done like that, you put it together for a fire weld. You overlap it, it's a special process too, but you overlap it to all intents and purposes. And then you hammer that into itself with a white hot heat. So we're talking about offsetting that or staving it up as they called it. It had to be lifted bodily and dropped on a steel plate on the floor to thicken it up. Yes. And you had to do that back for about two foot on each of the broken side. And then you put them together and that had to be all fire welded and drawn out to the required size. I think it took, if I remember right, I think it took a ton and a half of coal to do that in two fires. And it was four days and three nights? Four days and three nights. Six men? From, yes, from start to finish. I think the, t the, the money for that that time was about 26 or 28 pounds. But that was a lot of money. Oh, yeah. I don't know what year that would be. I suppose it would be maybe... Well, Mickey, just when we're talking eight, about... 18, 20, 30, something like 18, 30 or when we're When we're talking about Jack McCullough's, there's an interesting artefact here that people wouldn't realise the history of. Yes. This cross is situated in the Dominican Garden mm -hmm. uh, down uh, along the, the boundary mm. with Buttercrane. Yes. And uh, tell us what you know about that cross, Mickey. Well, the story I heard about it was, you see... I have to say, in all honesty, I wasn't really interested at the time, mm. but it always stuck with me for some reason. Mm -hmm. That cross was taken, well, by whatever means, it left the Dominican area or the Dominican chapel, for whatever reason. And it became lost. And McCullough bought it in as a piece of scrap, because he'd done that. Most of the blacksmiths bought in a bit of scrap where they had their own scrap but it, it arrived in his premises anyway and he recognised it and the story goes that he got in touch with whoever the prior it went back to where it came out of in the first place and, and it's, it's now located it's down in the garden yeah well that's yeah. that's a really interesting mm. story and, and a throwback mm. a real throwback to mm. past days isn't it yeah oh, it is surely that cross you may, you may not Realise, but that cross is about four, maybe four and a half hundred weight. Right. It doesn't look much sitting there, you know what I mean? But it's it's very heavy, all made again on the anvil with old, what they call old lone moor iron. There's only one place in Wales where you get the low moor iron. It was very easy manipulated and, and fire welded. And used to say you could weld it like butter. Well, Mickey, together, but looking, you know. looking at that cross... Is that is that a, a to the untrained eye? Is that a skilled piece of work? That's a ma there's massive skill behind that. I couldn't describe the skill there is in making that. I couldn't put it into words. But them them men done that. They they'd have threw a piece of iron in the fire there, and two or, two or three hours later, you see this artifact appear and start and you wonder how the hell it ever got to that stage. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Massive, massive, massive. Well, Mickey, our next image here, uh, again, relating to Jack McCullough's, is Sands's Mill oh. that people would be familiar <laughs> yes, with in, yes, in, yes. in New Street. I'm surprised they're still there. And you actually did the gates here. And Me, myself and a wee chap called Nevin Grattan from Loch Bricklin, a blacksmith. We made those gates in the workshop. They're 16 or 17 foot high, them. Mm -hmm. And... And all, they're all hand riveted, uh, board and, and, and tenant to, to the stale bars, and all the flat bars are riveted onto the, the horizontal bars. But the, the blinking gate was that big, we couldn't turn it over in the workshop. The workshop wasn't high enough. Right. So I had to carry it out onto the street, with a lot of help, of course. There's a half a ton in that, that one leaf, if you get. A half a, a ton? A half a ton. So that's uh, unbelievable. I remember well. And Mickey. What what sort of time span was involved in, well, in the not, manufacture of that gate? There's not an awful lot of work on it, a lot of drilling on it. And there's not an awful lot of work on it. Uh, 
If it was ornamental, there could be a month's work on it. Right. But it's not. It's just straightforward. Straightforward. Drill, yet. Th that back style would be drilled in four or five places and then a, a tannin formed on the crossbars and they'd be riveted through back and front. front well, and I'm, sure, I'm sure, Maggie, you must get, you must get a, a, a quiet sense of pride when you drive past well, and enough, see that still I there. I do, yeah. Every time I go past, I have a look at it. And I think of me and we Nevin Grattan. He was only about the size of me, but he was half his weight again. <laughs> You know, with the shoulder again, that rolling down, rolling that down the yard on tubing to take it onto the street and wait until six or seven hallions would be about strong fellas to turn it over, stand it up again and roll it in again and then let it down to, to finish the, the underside of it. And then how, how did you transport it to Sands' mill? Do you know, I forget how that happened, but I have a notion that Mr Mitchell up at the corner... Uh, a Bob grocer, Mitchell. Bob Mitchell is right. I think his lorry was commandeered. To take it. <laughs> McCullough would just wag the finger and that was all it would take you. So Very good. I need this left. Well, There's no problem. You talked about ornamental work, Mickey, and we can see here uh, our next image, uh, the these railings uh, going up the steps yes. at the Newry Cathedral. Yes, yes. And I'd imagine that was a difficult oh, that task. Was, that was a very, very difficult task. <coughs> there was a chap walking with us, he later became an ambulance driver, a chap from Kilevi as well, Anthony Hart. He was with us at the time. Do you see, you get a, McCulley used to say, I'm getting a new lad next week, but he mightn't stay awake. Right. He didn't like the dirt and the black and the hardship, and then you might get a lad that was keen and he'd stay a couple of years and maybe move on. Nobody ever stayed in it only myself. Right. So what did that say about me? Like, it wasn't right in the head. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Anthony Hart and myself done that with a novel lot. You see, that's curved and raising at the same time. Yeah, and you see that on it's the not, steps. It's not too bad doing a curve, but when you're curving and raising, the whole horizontal bar, it has to come and twist. You know what I'm saying? You can read this, it all right, but this end's going wrong because it's out of line with this end. Because... So you have, have to, to you have you to know. be aware of, you have of to the be rays a... all the time. Yes, it's, it's 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 in and out of the fire. It's in and out of the fire constant, and you tweak it with what we call dog bars. It's a little bar. You can make them make them up, you know, and you hold one and you put that wee twist from A to B, and you go to the next section. That's why it was so difficult. That there's a it's approaching two, two and a half, maybe three, maybe five. Hit that that horizontal bar, you know. Well, this and then that had all had to be either hot punched or drilled and squared out with a file to carry your, your vertical bars and they'd be riveted along the bottom. But yes, Rose, they, they done that, you see, in order to, it's nearly like a dream to me now, in order to take the, the cathedral frontage back from the street. Yeah. Hence the steps. <coughs> so that's, that's... And then we have this image of the, the overall yeah. railing at the yeah. cathedral garden. Yeah. Well, I, I, I re refurbished bits and pieces of that that got uh, rotted away and bent and twisted. Uh, it was in the 60s, 70s. Now but McLaughlin's of in Dublin, in Chicor Works, they, don't, they made that railing and the gates in the first place and any iron work that was done about the cathedral when it was built. They actually did a lot of the ecclesiastical work, Maggie, didn't think, they? I think they done it all, definitely in the south. I know I remember mm. delivering loads mm. of steel uh, into Midlachlands ah, uh, yes. in Jamestown Road in, in Inchicore. And um, it was, um, it was a, a, a nightmare of a place to go to because it was always uh, very, very busy mm. and there'd mm. be delays and... Yeah. But it was interesting, it, it, it just brought those memories back yeah. when you mentioned Midlachlan's, mm. no. you know. Oh, they were very skilled, but they were very big, they were, they were massive that time, like, but the country was full of new ironwork at the time, you know. Yeah. It came down from the Victorian and Edwardian era, and them skilled people were still there, you know. Now if we look at the next image that we have here, uh, we're back over to <laughs> the Dominican Chapel, yes. and I know this is something that you have sleepless nights. Oh, many, about. many a sleepless <laughs> night. 
the refurbished the chapel, they put a new roof on it and that sort of thing. And we were doing the railings out the front, refurbishing, yeah. refurbishing and making new sections for the wheelchair access. Aye. And the builder was pinning the walls and tidying up the walls, so he was scaffolded up to the, the eaves, as they're called, where the spouting would run. Yeah. But we had occasion to go up to take that cross down. There's a couple of pieces missing of it, rotted away and fell down. And there's a chap called Colin O'Rourke walking with me at the time from Jonesboro. But uh, Mickey not being the thinker, just went and done the job. We got a roof leather and went up the roof leather and a few pieces of scaffolding tube and formed a bit of a, a base just at the base of the, the cross in order to stand on. And that cross, there's four legs on it going down over a big uh, lump of timber which is coming up from the infrastructure on a taper and four bolts and two bolts in each leg. Mm. So we got the bolts out and we got the lead stepped off but then the job was to get this, these legs and run down about two foot down the, the timber frame. I wasn't as tall as Colin. <laughs> I'm standing on tippy toes on a two inch round scaffolding tube, nothing between me and the ground. Thought nothing of it. And I couldn't get that last quarter inch to get it off. But we managed it at, at the end of the day and we got it laid down on the, on the roof. Now that there, as I said, that's another thing that we catch out weight wise. There's two and a half to three hundred weight on that. So how did we get that over our heads? And I mean over our heads. And get it down, take it away, do it up, and take it back and put it on the same way. I should have been locked up at the time. Seriously. Should have been locked up. Wasn't right in the head. We wouldn't be worth lifting if we had to fall it. That there's 70 foot of the ground. Oh yeah, you can see mm. it there clearly yeah. in that in that picture. And did, did you yeah, actually there's, there's a picture of it there, Did you yeah. actually repair the cross on the roof? Oh no 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 no. I'd had to go back to the workshop for two or three days and to how be did, repaired. How did you just get it down? We let it down in a rope over the side. There was no crane. You couldn't get know, a crane around in there. Two of you just let two this yeah. cross down. Yep. Let it slide down the, the roof ladder. Over the eaves and down onto the footpath that runs around the Now, looking at that cross, Mickey, from that image well, could could you give us an idea as to the size of it? What what height is it? It's four foot from from the base. The the four legs that I talked about that was drilled and yeah. bolted to the from from that base it'd be over five foot, five foot six. But the actual cross itself would only be about four foot. So then after it, after you did the refurbishing in the workshop, mm. you had There's to repeat the performance. Correct and right. Pull and it up. Pull, pull it, up. it back up onto the roof, yeah. and get it manhandle yeah. it over and get yeah. it back into the base. Yeah, but you see, if I was using my head, and I would have got the builder to do that. He had plenty of men. We were only two. So we weren't better than two lads. Like what? Well, I was about twenty-two. Like Colin was. No idea. He was a big strong fellow and taller than me. As a matter of interest, Mickey, what, what would you what was the, the, the wages like then? <laughs> this is a, an annoying bit. I uh, at four and a half thousand that time for all the railings, refurbished the old ones, make up forty or forty or fifty foot of new ones, do that and do the guttering. I repaired the guttering right along them two eaves. There was an old cast iron guttering and they couldn't get it. So I patched it and cut up a piece of cast iron and profiled it in the shape and welded it into it. Done the job well, I put. No, I didn't. I got, a, I, got a, I got paid for it. There's no doubt about that. Paid the last shilling for it. But I didn't get any money out of it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It went on. I couldn't say to myself, there's £500 over the top. It doesn't work like that with us, you see. But anyway. It was done anyway. Nightmares. Well, working on your own account now, Mickey, you've got different jobs. And here's a, a, a cross from the gates at uh, Clog Chapel again. Yeah. 
And and what 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 exactly is this cross? That is a Celtic cross sitting on top of a cut granite stone pillar. Pillar. There's two of them. Uh, the, the 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 old cross that I took off there. I don't know what happened. It maybe a lorry cart or something, but it was badly damaged and it was a silly thing to start repairing. So I made a new one. So that's actually simply, that's a new, that's a new cross. That's a new cross, eh? And what roughly when did you make that, Maggie? Oh God, you have me now. Uh, Be late seventies, sort yeah, of. Around about the seventies, yeah. I was thinking yeah. that. See, I had to do that because one of the gates was badly rusted and. It was breaking apart. You well, know. that's that's the gate that, that we have here. That's now. correct. That's the, that's the, that's one. the left hand gate as yeah. you're going into the chapel. That's right. And this cross sits on sits top on of the, that pillar. Top of that pillar, yeah. yeah. A local man that told me done all that uh, granite work there. I heard that a man called Dan Posty, Dan O'Hare, they called him Posty, was originally a postman. Is that the man that lived up the Fork Hill Road? Correct and right, yes. Or Patrick Fern. I heard the story that he actually built that granite, whether he cut the granite stone or bought it in like that, I don't know. And of course, mm. Clog Chapel was opened on Easter Sunday, 1916. That's right, yeah. And we're mm. heading towards the, the centenary. That's right. And and we have another image of you here um, looking at the, the, right the, the right hand gate, yeah. and you're telling me that it's badly it's in need of refurbishment. Badly in need of refurbishment. I'll steal it one of these days and get it done. Now again, to get back to what we were talking about earlier on, uh, if, if, if we, we take a look here, um, the, the, uh, those railings, uh, just when, when, when you were talking about the difference mm. Uh, these are uh, the the Catholic Workingmen's Club, aren't they? I think they? that's the Catholic Workingmen's Club. Yeah. Property there, yeah. Now, you see the, see the cast iron posts? Yeah. They are more, most likely would have been made in uh, Bailey's Foundry, uh, way back when that place was built. If not, they'd have been made in Bally Bay, because they, they sort of specialise in that sort of stuff, you know. It's like the newer post at the bottom of a set of wooden stairs, if you notice. Victorian. Type thing, mm. but that that railing was 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 uh, put together with the old Victorian cast iron posts, and it's it's a fairly modern railing. The the, the finials on top the top of the bars crossbars there, they are turned on a lathe as opposed to being made in the fire. Now I think I think mm. we've got it. We've actually got an image here. If we mm -hmm. look on, move on. Uh, this is this is a, an image of. Yeah, a railing the, made in the fire, isn't it? That that uh, I made that for local builder Paul Madden. Now again, the original cast iron posters that I had nothing at all to do with them when he walked into them. <coughs> but now that's that, that that's actually outside the Procule House. That's right. In Hill Street. That's right. And uh, the 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 difference then that's the difference in uh, the two railings between the forged railing. Correct. And the other one is is. Those wee finials, they were made on the bar and, and, and uh, on the anvil. And you had to make tools for them different profiles, yeah. you know. Yeah, So that's the way that was done. And I, I, I'm afraid I pulled a wee stroke there. There's a little collar sits down over that top finial on top of the crossbar. Yes. And I couldn't get them. They should be cast iron to keep them original with the rest of the rails along there. Couldn't get them, so I made them up in lead. Um, I bluffed a wee bit, but there's no at this at this point, uh, I wanted to uh, disclaim <laughs> our responsibility. Uh, any legal writs or yes, communications yes. should yes. be addressed <laughs> to Mickey Mullen. Uh, uh, but getting back, Mickey, to what you were saying, um, I meant to say to you earlier on, uh, your the very name, I mean your father, uh, the late Mickey, and you're the fifth generation, aren't you? Fifth generation, Michael. Yes. And you have a son, Michael. And a son, Michael. And any grandchildren yet? We're waiting on him. We're waiting on him now. So, so there's actually six generations of the name. That's right. And they were nearly all stone cutters, funny you know. All in mm -hmm. the stone cutting. Yeah. And you're you're the first man, sort of the yeah that, that broke away from that. That's right. That's right. So. I shall make it back to you yet. Well, I suppose <laughs> any, any anything's possible, Mickey. Ah, they were all quarrymen and stone cutters and well dealers and. There's very few of them left now too. The machine does all that now. And and tell me, do you, when you look, you're you're t 
today you're still in in in, in that job. You're still in 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 the uh, in the fabricating, but I it, I'm retired. Like so I'm only footing about. Now yeah, but know. I mean, do you, does it sadden you to see the old ways? Well, no. Funny enough, I was getting very disappear. disillusioned about five years ago because it was dying out as I thought. But I got an awful surprise. There's an association of blacksmiths in based around Dublin, but yes. from all over the south, and I was very fortunate through a, a, a chap that I run about with two these weekends, a ch we chap called Jerry Lochran up and see Finn there. Yeah. He's one of the new, what I would call the new age blacksmiths. New and generation. He, I'm going to make a boast now. He is as good as there is in Europe. Well, that's There's praise, no that's praise coming mind. from you, Mickey. Well, he is. I know he is. And his compatriots, to varying degrees, they're as good as there is in Europe. But Jerry's very keen, loves the game, puts his whole life and soul into it, and very lucky that still now, Mickey, fairly busy, you know, because it all went to the wall with the Celtic Tiger there, and people got caught left, right, and centre, and it's a shame. What? Because it puts all these fellas back on their, on their haunches, you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's lads down there had opened up modern workshops and put everything into it, and now there's no work. Some of them branched out into other things. Just to let them get a living. Mm. But there, it's, I always felt, and McCullough always said it, if it's in your blood, you'll be good at it. And if it's not, we'll get out of it. Mm. It's as simple as that. But well, it's the same thing applies to good carpenters, joiners, or whatever, you it's know. The, it's the mm. square peg in a round hole, well, ethos, is it. Yeah. isn't yeah. it? This you is know, it, it doesn't mm. work. Yeah. But mm. um, what's the name of the association, Mickey? IABA, Irish Artist Blacksmiths Association. And they, they have a website? They have a website, yes. Uh, um, and, and people can actually see Jared well, Locker at work? You can see him working on, I call them these new devices. I couldn't even switch one on, I'm not interested, mm. but they're, they're a great tool. Now, Mickey, um, just while we're talking about the association, the members are drawn from all over Ireland. All over they? Ireland, and we're hoping to get... There's a few blacksmiths in Northern Ireland. Uh, there was there was more, and on, on they started the end of the fabricating all to the Celtic Tiger type thing there, and they bought into... You see, you could buy an awful lot of artefacts from the continent, and especially... Germany, France, uh, China, they go down on the bandwagon too. You could buy the makings of a gate and a set of railings from here to the point. Mm. You'd buy it all across the counter. You didn't do anything at all to it when you stick it together with the, the yeah. welder. A lot of them grew up, you see, and that has sort of spoiled the old traditional way. Mm. But people, especially young people, funny enough, they don't want the modern stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. But then the handmade stuff is very expensive. Well, I know uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Maggie, because I know that uh, Gerard Lochern had a commission uh, with the uh, architects who designed Sean Quinn's that is house correct, over right, in Fermanagh yes. and Calvin. Yes. That's why I say he's as good as there is in Europe, to be fair to him. And what did he make for Sean Quinn? The theme of that uh, job he done, he put a set of uh, balustrades on um, an all marble staircase uh, covering maybe 30, 40, 50, 60 metres return, return around the top well, as it's called. And the theme was uh, something to do with the bog land. Uh, it had a depict bull rushes on it and a, a few dragonflies through it and a few butterflies, they were all done in stainless steel. You wouldn't see butter coming out anywhere in the world. It sounds a very intricate piece, Mickey. Oh, it's very, very, very intricate piece. You had two or three uh, chaps walking from there, and it, that was a six months, nine months job, like. It's very hard to walk uh, stainless steel, and, and then you have to polish it back. And did he do all this up at... Up he at done all that up in Caliva there, up in Seafin, yes. And then went over and and, and constructed and, and it fitted it. That's in right. the house. Yeah. We've and Mickey, we've um, done a job over in Ackle Island too, with a uh, 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 what would you call it? Like a medieval theme. We're showing dragons on it, 
fire breathing dragons on a, on a, on a, on a bar top and Celtic stuff running through it as well. Fabulous job, fabulous work. You need awful patience for that, you know. You need awful skill for it. it, it uh, you took the word out of my mm, mouth. True yeah, skill, mm, Mickey. Yeah. Mm. And, a, and a day mm. in art. A day in art. Well, hopefully it's not day. No, it, it, uh, I think it'll come back again. You can't do it at the blacksmiths at the end of the day, you know. Well, I know. It just cannot be done without. <laughs> and that's it. There may not be an awful lot of work for uh, as many of them again, you know. But are you putting a, are you putting a case forward for a golden card, Mickey, to no, stay no, here indefinitely? No, no, it's, it's, it's not. It's not a matter of that. But uh, no, I know. I know what you're saying. You well, the I know that that the association goes to uh, exhibitions all over the country, I and do, yeah. and a couple of years ago, yourself and Jared. Uh, you had 45 or 46 exhibits in a Titanic yes. exhibition, hadn't no, that's you? That's only, only the beginning of the year, though. This year? Ah, right, come around Christmas. Right. I tend to forget about times. But, yes, but we had 47 to be exact. 47 And they exhibits. came from all over Ireland. And, 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 they, and were, they were exhibited there for six weeks. And you actually, mm. uh, you had a lifeboat there. Well, no, it, it was uh, presented to them by Ayaba. We all went down to, uh, uh, the other side of Dublin there, where your man stole the painting, sort of. Oh, well, Rossborough House. Rossborough House. Uh, we made a lifeboat up there. I finished. We run out of time because you can't do all them things in the one day. I finished it up at the workshop, and myself and Jerry got it finished off and presented it to them in uh, the Titanic. It's a replica of a uh, Titanic lifeboat, oars and all on it. And Lovely. Bit of rope showing on anchors and all that kind of seat in them. And now, now... Um, clinker built, by the way. Clinker it wasn't, built. It wasn't just a bit of sheet metal. Uh -huh. It was all shaped, the clinker built idea. Lovely. And, uh, and now you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to undertake a commission for the Newry Maritime Association yes, yes, to yes, mark yes, the yes. loss mm. of the SS Alder. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's going to be a bow section, yeah. a steel bow section. That's right. What that yeah. we're going to sit at Victoria yeah. Locks. Yeah, well, the, I'm in the position now where I'm a lot of arthritis and I have a lad that gives me a hand to do the, the bulwark, so to speak. I'll be instructing him how to cut it and mm. bend it and shape it and that sort of thing because... And hopefully these, here at these Destination Newry we'll, we'll be able to keep uh, a check on, on the progress oh, ah, yes. no problem. of this yeah. project, how, yeah. how we're getting on. Mm -hmm. How long do you envisage it's going to take, Mickey? Nah, I suppose there's three weeks work on it, constant work on it, but we have three months, haven't we? Well, we're going to, we hope to unveil it on the 10th of August at yeah. Victoria Locks. We'll, we'll meet the deadline. Good man, for, Mickey. For day and the attempt. And thank you very much for oh, coming uh, in today. Just, just, just Never before shake you go. the left, always shake just, the right, Mickey. Just before you close, uh, I think it's worth mentioning the, the hive of knowledge over in uh, Monaghan. Yes. Did you get any news about that? No. Well, there was 200 blacksmiths from all over the world came and made that and put all their, their panels in it. The way it worked was a, 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 a chap in Cork, he made the, the shape of the beehive, which had a six foot footprint and stood 12 foot in the air. Yeah. And it was all made out of 60 mil round solid bar. Punched through with six rings, uh, graduating rings running after it to, to form the hive. Uh, a bee that, hive, that, yeah. That left what we called windows in it. Uh -huh. And all these blacksmiths from all over the world, they put their own design into each window. And some of our lads done the same. And when was that done? That was done it must be 18 months ago now. Uh, it's not erected yet because they couldn't make up their mind whether they were going to galvanise it or let it just go rusty, which wouldn't be a great way of doing it. Like. And, it's, and where is it now? It's sitting over in Monaghan. They'll be erecting it now soon. I think they're going to erect it out in front of the town hall. Very but good. that was a massive, massive, massive job. Uh, we brushed, we rubbed shoulders, so to speak, with a man called Gazetu. A Brazilian, brilliant, brilliant man. He made a life-size horse out of heavy material and he made it in such a way 
that is a puzzle. And the story is that there's a £10,000 prize for anyone worldwide that can take it apart and put it together again. And it seems that a good few tried it, but it didn't work out. Nobody succeeded. He, he made it. it. And due to the fact that he made it, he knows how it comes apart. It's all loose. Uh -huh. You know, you just pull it. Pull a leg off, but you know yeah. how to. You need to know how to do it. His last commission for New Zealand was six and a half million for some artifact setting out. He'll not be working for Newry Maritime Association, not, Maggie. He'll not, no. I don't think there's any threat to your future. <laughs> he'll not, no, he'll not, he'll not, no. Well, but, Maggie, but man, like that, that was a great experience. I really enjoyed talking to you. Well, so we'll talk again sometime. And we will talk again, yeah. and we'll, we'll be watching with interest uh, our memorial for the Alder. You'll have, you'll have your memorial on the date. Thank you very fair, much, Mickey. Fair enough. Thank you. Fair enough.